Chapter 43 Toronaga watched the tall priest approach across the clearing, the flickering light of the torches making the lean face starker than usual above the blackness of his beard. The priest's orange Buddhist robe was elegant and a rosary and cross hung at his waist. Ten paces away Father Alvito stopped, knelt, and bowed deferentially, beginning the customary formalities. Toranaga was sitting alone on the dais, guards in a semicircle around him, well out of hearing. Only Blackthorn was nearby and he lolled against the platform as he had been ordered, his eyes boring into the priest. Alvito appeared not to notice him. It is good to see you, sire, Father Alvito said when it was polite to do so. And to see you, Tsukasan. Toranaga motioned the priest to make himself comfortable on the cushion that had been placed on a tatame on the ground in front of the platform. It's a long time since I saw you. Yes, sire, there's much to tell. Alvito was deeply conscious that the cushion was on the earth and not on the dais. Also, he was acutely aware of the samurai swords that Blackthorn now wore so near to Toranaga and the way he slouched with such indifference. I bring a confidential message from my superior, the father visitor, who greets you with deference. Thank you. But first, tell me about you. Ah, sire, Alvito said, knowing that Toranaga was far too discerning not to have noticed the remorse that beset him, much as he had tried to throw it off. Tonight I'm too aware of my own failings. Tonight I'd like to be allowed to put off my earthly duties and go into a retreat to pray, to beg for God's favor. He was shamed by his own lack of humility. Although Joseph's sin had been terrible, Alvito had acted with haste and anger and stupidity. It was his fault that a soul had been outcast, to be lost forever. Our Lord once said, Please, Father, let this cup pass from me. But even he had to retain the cup we, in the world, we have to try to follow in his footsteps as best we can. Please excuse me for allowing my problem to show. What was your cup, old friend? Alvito told him. He knew there was no reason to hide the facts for, of course, Toranaga would hear them very soon if he did not already know them, and it was much better to hear the truth than a garbled version. It's so very sad to lose a brother. Terrible to make one an outcast, however terrible the crime. I should have been more patient. It was my fault. Where is he now? I don't know, sire. Toranaga called the guard. Find the renegade Christian and bring him to me at noon tomorrow. The samurai hurried away. I beg mercy for him, sire, Alvito said quickly, meaning it. But he knew whatever he said would do little to dissuade Toranaga from a path already chosen. Again he wished the society had its own secular arm empowered to arrest and punish apostates, like elsewhere in the world. He had repeatedly recommended that this be created but he had always been overruled, herein. Japan, and also in Rome by the general of the order. Yet without our own secular arm, he thought tiredly. We'll never be able to exercise real discipline over our brethren and our flock. Why aren't there ordained priests within your society, Sukkosan? Because, sire, not one of our acolytes is yet sufficiently well trained. For instance, Latin is an absolute necessity because our order requires any brother to travel anywhere in the world at any time, and Latin, unfortunately, is very difficult to learn. Not one is trained yet or ready. Alvito believed this with all his heart. He was also bitterly opposed to a Japanese-ordained Jesuit clergy, in opposition to the Father Visitor. Eminence, he had always said, I beg you, don't be fooled by their modest and decorous exterior. Underneath their all unreliable characters, and their pride and Japanese-ness will always dominate in the end. They'll never be true servants of the society or reliable soldiers of his holiness, the vicar of Christ on earth, obedient to him alone. Never. Alvito glanced momentarily at Blackthorn, then back to Toranaga, who said, But two or three of these apprentice priests speak Latin, nay, and Portuguese? It's true what that man said, nay. Why haven't they been chosen? So sorry, 
but the general of our society doesn't consider them sufficiently prepared. Perhaps Joseph's tragic fall is an example. Bad to break a solemn oath, Torinaga said. He remembered the year the three boys had sailed off from Nagasaki in a black ship to be fated in the court of the Spanish king and the court of the high priest of the Christians, the same year Garoda had been assassinated. Nine years later they had returned but all their time away had been carefully controlled and monitored. They had left as naive, youthful Christian zealots and returned just as narrow-minded and almost as ill-informed as when they had left. Stupid waste, Torinaga thought, waste of an incredible opportunity which Garoda had refused to take advantage of, as much as he had advised it. No, Torasan, we need the Christians against the Buddhists, Garoda had said. Many Buddhist priests and monks are soldiers, nay? Most of them are. The Christians aren't, nay? Let the giant priest have the three yous he wants theory only Kyushu stumbleheads, nay? I tell you to encourage Christians. Don't bother me with a ten-year plan, but burn every Buddhist monastery within reach. Buddhists are like flies on carrion, and Christians nothing but a bag of fart. Now they're not, Torinaga thought with growing irritation. Now they're hornets. Yes, he said aloud. Very bad to break an oath and shout and disturb the harmony of an inn. Please excuse me, sire, and forgive me for mentioning my problems. Thank you for listening. As always your concern makes me feel better. May I be permitted to greet the pilot? Torinaga assented. I must congratulate you, pilot. Alvito said in Portuguese. Your swords suit you. Thank you, father, I'm learning to use them. Blackthorn replied. But sorry to say, I'm not very good with them yet. I'll stick to pistols or cutlasses or cannon when I have to fight. I pray that you may never have to fight again, pilot, and that your eyes will be open to God's infinite mercy. Mine are open. Yours are fogged. For your own soul's sake, pilot, keep your eyes open and your mind open. Perhaps you may be mistaken. Even so, I must thank you for saving Lord Toronada's life. Who told you that? Alvito did not reply. He turned back to Toronaga. What was said? Torinaga asked, breaking a silence. Alvito told him, adding, Though he's the enemy of my faith and a pirate, I'm glad he saved you, sire. God moves in mysterious ways. You've honored him greatly by making him samurai. He's had a motto also. Torinaga was pleasured by the priest's fleeting amazement. Did you bring a dictionary? Yes, sire, with several of the maps you wanted, showing some of the Portuguese bases en route from Doha. The book's in my luggage. May I send someone for it, or may I give it to him later myself? Give it to him later. Tonight, or tomorrow. Did you also bring the report? About the alleged guns that were supposed to be brought from Macau. The father visitor is preparing it, sire. And the numbers of Japanese mercenaries employed at each of your new bases? The father visitor has requested an up-to-date report from all of them, sire which he will give you as soon as they're complete. Good. Now tell me, how did you know about my rescue? Hardly a thing that happens to Toranaga no Minawara is not the subject of rumor and legend. Coming from Mishima we heard that you were almost swallowed up in an earthquake, sire, but that the golden barbarian had pulled you out. Also, that you'd done the same for him and a lady I presume the Lady Mariko? Toranaga nodded briefly. Yes. She's here in Yokos. He thought a moment then said, Tomorrow she would like to be confessed, according to your customs. But only those things that are non-political. I would imagine that excludes everything to do with me and my various Hatamoto, nay? I explained that to her also. Alvito bowed his understanding. With your permission, could I say mass for all the Christians here, sire? It would be very discreet, of course. Tomorrow? I'll consider it. Torinaga continued to talk about inconsequential matters for a while, then he said, You have a message for me? From your chief priest? With humility, sire, I beg to say that it was a private message. 
Torunaga pretended to think about that, even though he had determined exactly how the meeting would proceed and had already given the Anjin San specific instructions how to act and what to say. Very well. He turned to Blackthorn. Anjin San, you can go now and we'll talk more later. Yes, sire, Blackthorn replied. So sorry, the black ship. Arrive Nagasaki? Ah, yes. Thank you, he replied, pleased that the Anjin San's question didn't sound rehearsed. Well, Tsuka San, has it docked yet? Alvito was startled by Blackthorn's Japanese and greatly perturbed by the question. Yes, sire. It docked fourteen days ago. Ah, fourteen? said Torunaga. You understand, Anjin San? Yes. Thank you. Good. Anything else you can ask Tsukasen later, nay? Yes, sire. Please excuse me. Blackthorn got up and bowed and wandered off. Torunaga watched him go. A most interesting man for a pirate. Now, first tell me about the black ship. It arrived safely, sire, with the greatest cargo of silk that has ever been. Alvito tried to sound enthusiastic. The arrangement made between the Lord's Harima, Kiyama, Onoshir, and yourself is in effect. Your treasury will be richer with tens of thousands of Koban by this time. Next year. The quality of silks is the finest, sire. I've brought a copy of the manifest for your quartermaster. The Captain General Ferriera sends his respects, hoping to see you in person soon. That was the reason for my delay in coming to see you. The Visitor General sent me post-haste from Osaka to Nagasaki to make certain everything was perfect. Just as I was leaving Nagasaki we heard you'd left Yido for Aizu, so I came here as quickly as I could, by ship to Port Namazu with one of our fastest cutters, then by road. At Mishima I fell in with Lord Zataki and asked permission to join him. Your ship's still at Namazu? Yes, sire. It will wait for me there. Good. For a moment Torunaga wondered whether or not to send Mariko by that ship to Osaka, then decided to deal with that later. Please give the manifest to the quartermaster tonight. Yes, sire. And the arrangement about this year's cargo is sealed? Yes. Absolutely. Good. Now the other part. The important part. Alvito's hands went dry. Neither Lord Kiyama nor Lord Onoshir will agree to forsake General Ishido. I'm sorry. They will not agree to join your banner now in spite of our strongest suggestion. Torunaga's voice became low and cruel. I already pointed out I required more than suggestions. I'm sorry to bring bad news in this part, sire, but neither would agree to publicly come over to, ah, uh, publicly, you say? What about privately, secretly? Privately they were both as adamant as pub. You talk to them separately or together? Of course together, and separately, most confidentially, but nothing we suggested would. You only suggested a course of action? Why didn't you order them? It's as the father visitor said, sire, we can't order any daimyo or any ah, uh, but you can order one of your brethren? Nay? Yes. Sire, did you threaten to make them outcasts too? No, sire. Why? Because they've committed no mortal sin. Alvito said it firmly, as he and Delacqua had agreed, but his heart was fluttering and he hated to be the bearer of terrible tidings, which were even worse now because the Lord Harima, who legally owned Nagasaki, had told them privately that all his immense wealth and influence were going to Ishido. Please excuse me, sire but I don't make divine rules any more than you made the code of Bushido, the way of the warrior. We, we have to comply with what, you make a poor fool outcast for a natural act like pillowing, but when two of your converts behave unnaturally yes, even treacherously when I seek your help, urgent help and I'm your friend you only make suggestions. You understand the seriousness of this, nay? I'm sorry, lord. Please excuse me, but... Perhaps I won't excuse you, Tsukasan. It's been said before, now everyone has to choose a side, Torunaga said. Of course we are on your side, sire. 
but we cannot order Lord Kiyama or Lord Onoshir to do anything. Fortunately, I can order my Christian. Sire? I can order the Anjin San freed. With his ship. With his cannon. Beware of him, sire. The pilot's diabolically clever, but he's a heretic, a pirate and not to be trust. Here the Anjin San's a samurai and Hatamoto. At sea perhaps he's a pirate. If he's a pirate, I imagine he'll attract many other corsairs and wacko to him many of them. What a foreigner does on the open seas his own business, nay. That's always been our policy. Nay, Alvito kept quiet and tried to make his brain function. No one had planned on the Injilis becoming so close to Toranaga. Those two Christian daimyos will make no commitments, not even a secret one. No, sire. We tried ev, no concession, none? No, sire. No barter, no arrangement, no compromise, nothing? No, sire. We tried every inducement and persuasion. Please believe me. Alvito knew he was in the trap and some of his desperation showed. If it were me, yes, I would threaten them with excommunication, though it would be a false threat because I'd never carry it through, not unless they had committed a mortal sin and wouldn't confess or be penitent and submit. But even a threat for temporal gain would be very wrong of me, sire, a mortal sin. I'd risk eternal damnation. Are you saying if they sinned against your creed then you'd cast them out? Yes. But I'm not suggesting that could be used to bring them to your side, sire. Please excuse me, but they. They're totally opposed to you at the moment. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. They both made it very clear, together and in private. Before God I pray they change their minds. We gave you our words to try, before God, the Father Visitor and I. We fulfilled our promise. Before God we failed. Then I shall lose. Torinaga said. You know that, don't you? If they stand allied with Ishido, all the Christian daimyos will side with him. Then I have to lose. Twenty samurai against one of mine. Nay? Yes. What's their plan? When will they attack me? I don't know, sire. Would you tell me if you did? Yes, yes, I would. I doubt it, Torinaga thought, and looked away into the night the burden of his worry almost crushing him. Is it to be Crimson Sky after all, he asked himself helplessly? The stupid, bound to fail lunge at Kyoto? He hated the shameful cage that he was in. Like the Taiko and Garoda before him, he had to tolerate the Christian priests because the priests were as inseparable from the Portuguese traders as flies from a horse, holding absolute temporal and spiritual power over their unruly flock. Without the priests there was no trade. Their goodwill as negotiators and middlemen in the black ship operation was vital because they spoke the language and were trusted by both sides, and if ever the priests were completely forbidden the empire, all barbarians would obediently sail away, never to return. He remembered the one time that Tycho had tried to get rid of the priests yet still encouraged trade. For two years there was no black ship. Spies reported how the giant chief of the priests, sitting like a poisonous black spider in Macau, had ordered no more trade in reprisal for the Tycho's expulsion edicts, knowing that at length the Tycho must humble himself. In the third year he had bowed to the inevitable and invited the priests back, turning a blind eye to his own edicts and to the treason and rebellion the priests had advocated. There's no escape from that reality, Torinaga thought. None. I don't believe what the Anjinsen says that trade is as essential to barbarians as it is to us, that their greed will make them trade, no matter what we do to the priests. The risk is too great to experiment, and there's no time, and I don't have the power. We experimented once and failed. Who knows? Perhaps the priests could wait us out ten years. They're ruthless enough. If the priests order no trade, I believe there will be no trade. We could not wait ten years. Even five years. And if we expel all barbarians it must take twenty years for the English barbarian to fill up the gap, 
if the Anji San is telling the whole truth and if and it is an immense if if the Chinese would agree to trade with them against the southern barbarians. I don't believe the Chinese will change their pattern. They never have. Twenty years is too long. Ten years is too long. There's no escape from that reality. Or the worst reality of all, the specter that secretly petrified Garoda and the Tycho and is now rearing its foul head again, that the fanatical, fearless Christian priests, if pushed too far, will put all their influence and their trading power and see power behind one of the great Christian daimyos. Further, they would engineer an invasion force of ironclad, equally fanatic conquistadores armed with the latest muskets to support this one Christian daimyo like they almost did the last time. By themselves, any number of invading barbarians and their priests are no threat against our overwhelming joint forces. We smash the hordes of Kublai Khan, and we can deal with any invader. But allied to one of our own, a great Christian daimyo with armies of samurai, and given civil wars throughout the realm, this could, ultimately, give this one daimyo absolute power over all of us. Kiyama or Onosher? It's obvious now, that has to be the priest's scheme. The timing's perfect. But which daimyo? Both, initially, helped by Harima of Nagasaki. But who'll carry the final banner? Kiyama because Onoshu the leper's not long for this earth and Onoshi's obvious reward for supporting his hated enemy and rival, Kiyama, would be a guaranteed, painless, everlasting life in the Christian heaven with a permanent seat at the right hand of the Christian God. They've 400,000 samurai between them now. Their base is Kyushu, and that island's safe from my grasp. Together those two could easily subjugate the whole island, then they have limitless troops, limitless food, all the ships necessary for an invasion, all the silk, and Nagasaki. Throughout the land there are perhaps another five or six hundred thousand Christians. Of these, more than half the Jesuit Christian converts are samurai, all salted nicely among the forces of all daimyos, a vast pool of potential traitors, spies, or assassins should the priests order it. And why shouldn't they? They'd get what they want above life itself, absolute power over all our souls, thus over the soul of this land of the gods to inherit our earth, and all that it contains just as the Anjin San has explained has already happened fifty times in this new world of theirs. They convert a king, then use him against his own kind, until all the land is swallowed up. It's so easy for them to conquer us, this tiny band of barbarian priests. How many are there in all Japan? Fifty or sixty? But they've the power. And they believe. They're prepared to die gladly for their beliefs, with pride and with bravery, with the name of their god on their lips. We. Saw that at Nagasaki when the Taiko S experiment proved a disastrous mistake. Not one of the priests recanted, tens of thousands witnessed the burnings, tens of thousands were converted, and this, martyrdom, gave the Christian religion immense prestige that Christian priests have fed on ever since. For me, the priests have failed, but that won't deter them from their relentless course. That's reality, too. So, it's Kiyama. Is the plan already settled, with Ishido a dupe and the Lady Okiba and Yemen also? Has Harima already thrown in with them secretly? Should I launch the Anjinsan at the black ship and Nagasaki immediately? What shall I do? Nothing more than usual. Be patient, seek harmony, put aside all worries about I or thou, life or death, oblivion or afterlife, now or then, and set a new plan into motion. What plan? He wanted to shout in desperation. There isn't one. It saddens me that those two stay with the real enemy. I swear we tried, sire. Alvito watched him compassionately, seeing the heaviness of his spirit. Yes. I believe that. I believe you and the Father Visitor kept your solemn promise, so I will keep mine. You may begin to build your temple at Yido at once. The land has been set aside. I cannot forbid the priests, the other Harris, entrance to the empire, but at least I can make them unwelcome in my domain. The new barbarians will be equally unwelcome, if they ever arrive. 
as to the Anjin San? Torunaga shrugged. But how long all this? Well, that's karma, ne? Alvido was thanking God fervently for his mercy and favor at the unexpected reprieve. Thank you, sire, he said, hardly able to talk. I know you'll not regret it. I pray that your enemies will be scattered like chaff and that you may reap the rewards of heaven. I'm sorry for my harsh words. They were spoken in anger. There's so much. Torunaga got up ponderously. You have my permission to say your service tomorrow, old friend. Thank you, sire, Alvito said, bowing low, pitying the normally majestic man. Thank you with all my heart. May the divinity bless you and take you into his keeping. Torunaga trudged into the inn, his guards following. Naga-san! Yes, father, the youth said, hurrying up. Where's the lady Mariko? There, sire, with Bantaro-san. Naga pointed to the small, lantern-lit cha house inside its enclosure in the garden, the shadowed figures within. Shall I interrupt the Chanoyu? A Chanoyu was a formal extremely ritualized tea ceremony. No. That must never be interfered with. Where are Omi and Yabu-san? They're at their end, sire. Naga indicated the sprawling low building on the other side of the river, near the far bank. Who chose that one? I did, sire. Please excuse me, you asked me to find them an inn on the other side of the bridge. Did I misunderstand you? The Anjin-san? He's in his room, sire. He's waiting in case you want him. Again Torunaga shook his head. I'll see him tomorrow. After a pause, he said in the same faraway voice, I'm going to take a bath now. Then I don't wish to be disturbed till dawn except. Naga waited uneasily, watching his father stare sightlessly into space, greatly disconcerted by his manner. Are you all right, father? What? Oh, yes, yes, I'm all right. Why? Nothing, please excuse me. Do you still want to hunt at Dom? Hunt? Ah, yes, that's a good idea. Thank you for suggesting it. Yes, that would be very good. See to it. Well, good night. Oh, yes, that Sakusan has my permission to give a private service tomorrow. All Christians may go. You go also. Sire? On the first day of the new year, you will become a Christian. Me? Yes, of your own free will. Tell Tsukasan privately. Sire? Torinaga wheeled on him. Are you deaf? Don't you understand the simplest thing anymore? Please excuse me. Yes, father. I understand. Good. Torinaga fell back into his distracted attitude, then wandered off, his personal bodyguard in tow. All samurai bowed stiffly but he took no notice of them. An officer came up to Naga, equally apprehensive. What's the matter with our lord? I don't know, Yashinaka-san. Naga looked back at the clearing. Alvito was just leaving, heading toward the bridge, a single samurai escorting him. Must be something to do with him. I've never seen Lord Toronaga walk so heavily. Never. They say they say that barbarian priest's a magician. A wizard. He must be to speak our tongue so well, nay? Could he have put a spell on our lord? No. Never. Not my father. Barbarians make my spine shake too, Nagasan. Did you hear about the Rotsakusan and his band shouting and quarreling like ill-mannered ETA? Yes. Disgusting. I'm sure that man must have destroyed my father's harmony. If you asked me... An arrow in that priest's throat would save our master a lot of trouble. Yes. Perhaps we should tell Buntaro-san about Lord Torinaga? He's our senior officer. I agree, but later. My father said clearly I was not to interrupt the Chanoyu. I'll wait till he's finished. In the peace and quiet of the little house, Buntaro fastidiously opened the small earthenware tea caddy of the Tang dynasty and, with equal care, took up the bamboo spoon beginning the final part of the ceremony. Deftly he spooned up exactly the right amount of green powder and put it into the handleless porcelain cup an ancient cast-iron kettle was singing over the charcoal. 
With the same tranquil grace Buntaro poured the bubbling water into the cup, replaced the kettle on its tripod, then gently beat the powder and water with the bamboo whisk to blend it perfectly. He added a spoonful of cool water, bowed to Mariko, who knelt opposite him, and offered the cup she bowed and took it with equal refinement, admiring the green liquid, and sipped three. Times rested then sipped again, finishing it. She offered the cup back. He repeated the symmetry of the formal cha-making and again offered it. She begged him to taste the cha himself, as was expected of her. He sipped, and then again, and finished it. Then he made a third cup and a fourth. More was politely refused. With great care, ritually he washed and dried the cup, using the peerless cotton cloth, and laid both in their places. He bowed to her, and she to him. The chanoyu was finished. Bantaro was content that he had done his best and that now, at least for the moment, there was peace between them. This afternoon there had been none. He had met her palanquin. At once, as always, he had felt coarse and uncouth in contrast to her fragile perfection like one of the wild, despised, barbaric hairy Ainu tribesmen that once inhabited the land but were now driven to the far north, across the straits, to the unexplored island of Hokkaido. All of his well-thought-out words had left him and he clumsily invited her to the Chanoyu, adding, It's years since we. I've never given one for you but tonight will be convenient. Then he had blurted out, never meaning to say it, knowing that it was stupid, inelegant, and a vast mistake. Lord Toronaga said it was time for us to talk. But you do not, sire? In spite of his resolve he flushed, and his voice rasped. I'd like harmony between us, yes, and more. I've never changed, nay? Of course, sire, and why should you? If there's any fault it's not your place to change but mine. If any fault exists, it's because of me. Please excuse me. I'll excuse you, he said, towering over her there beside the palanquin, deeply conscious that others were watching, the Anjin San and Omi among them. She was so lovely and tiny and unique, her hair piled high, her lowered eyes seemingly so demure, yet for him filled now with that same black ice that always sent him into a blind, impotent frenzy making him want to kill and shout and mutilate and smash and behave the way a samurai never should behave. I've reserved the cha house for tonight, he told her. For tonight, after the evening meal. We're ordered to eat the evening meal with Lord Toronaga. I would be honored if you would be my guest afterwards. It's I who am honored. She bowed and waited with the same lowered eyes and he wanted to smash her to death into the ground then go off and plunge his knife crisscross into his belly and let the eternal pain cleanse the torment from his soul. He saw her look up at him discerningly. Was there anything else, sire? She asked, so softly. The sweat was running down his back and thighs, staining his kimono, his chest hurting like his head. Yuri Yuri staying at the inn tonight. Then he had left her and made careful dispositions for the whole baggage train. As soon as he could, he had handed his duties over to Naga and strode off with a pretended truculence down the river bank, and when he was alone, he had plunged naked into the torrent, careless of his safety, and fought the river until his head had cleared and the pounding ache had gone. He had lain on the bank collecting himself. Now that she had accepted he had to begin. There was little time. He summoned his strength and walked back to the rough garden gate that was within the mother garden, and stood there for a moment rethinking his plan. Tonight he wanted everything to be perfect. Obviously the hut was imperfect, like its garden an uncouth provincial attempt at a real cha house. Never mind, he thought, now completely absorbed in his task, it will have to do. Night will hide many faults, and lights will have to create the form it lacks. Servants had already brought the things he had ordered earlier tatamas, pottery oil lamps, and cleaning utensils the very best in yokos, everything brand new but modest, discreet and unpretentious. He stripped off his kimono, laid down his swords, and began to clean. First the tiny reception room and kitchen and veranda. Then the winding path and the flagstones that were let into the moss, and finally the rocks and skirting garden. 
He scrubbed and broomed and brushed until everything was spotless, letting himself swoop into the humility of manual labor that was the beginning of the Chanoyu, where the host alone was required to make everything faultless. The first perfection was absolute cleanliness. By dusk he had finished most of the preparations. Then he had bathed meticulously, endured the evening meal, and the singing. As soon as he could he had changed again into more somber clothes and hurried back to the garden. He latched the gate. First he put the taper to the oil lamps. Then, carefully, he sprinkled water on the flagstones and the trees that were now splashed here and there with flickering light, until the tiny garden was a fairy land of dewdrops dancing in the warmth of the summer's breeze. He repositioned some of the lanterns. Finally satisfied, he unlatched the gate and went to the vestibule. The carefully selected pieces of charcoal that had been placed punctiliously in a pyramid on white sand were burning correctly. The flowers seemed correct in the takanama. Once more he cleaned the already impeccable utensils. The kettle began to sing, and he was pleased with the sound that was enriched by the little pieces of iron he had placed so diligently in the bottom. All was ready. The first perfection of the Chanoyu was cleanliness, the second, complete simplicity. The last and greatest, suitability to the particular guest or guests. He heard her footsteps on the flagstones, the sound of her dipping her hands richly in the cistern of fresh river water and drying them. Three soft steps up to the veranda. Two more to the curtain doorway. Even she had to bend to come through the tiny door that was made deliberately small to humble everyone. At a Chanoyu all were equal, host and guests, the most high daimyo and merest samurai. Even a peasant if he was invited. First she studied her husband's flower arrangement. He had chosen the blossom of a single white wild rose and put a single pearl of water on the green leaf and set it on red stones. Autumn is coming. He was suggesting with the flower, talking through the flower, do not weep for the time of fall, the time of dying when the earth begins to sleep. Enjoy the time of beginning again and experience the glorious cool of the autumn air on this summer evening. Soon the tear will vanish and the rose, only the stones will remain soon you and I will vanish and only the stones will remain. He watched her, apart from himself, now deep in the near trance that a Cha master sometimes was fortunate enough to experience, completely in harmony with his surroundings. She bowed to the flower in homage and came and knelt opposite him. Her kimono was dark brown, a thread of burnt gold at the seams enhancing the white column of her throat and face, her obi the darkest of greens that matched the under kimono, her hair simple and upswept and unadorned. You are welcome, he said with a bow beginning the ritual. It is my honor, she replied, accepting her role. He served the tiny repast on a blemishless lacquer tray, the chopsticks placed just so, the slivers of fish on rice that he had prepared a part of the pattern, and to complete the effect, a few wild flowers that he had found near the river bank scattered in perfect disarray. When she had finished eating and he, in his turn, had finished eating, he lifted the tray, every movement. Formalized to be observed and judged and recorded and took it through the low doorway into the kitchen. Then alone, at rest, Mariko watched the fire critically, the coals a glowing mountain on a sea of stark white sand below the tripod, her ears listening to the hissing sound of the fire melding with the sighing of the barely simmering kettle above, and from the unseen kitchen. The sibilance of cloth on porcelain and water cleaning the already clean. In time her eyes wandered to the raw twisted rafters and to the bamboos and the reeds that formed the thatch. The shadows cast by the few lamps he had placed seemingly at random made the small large and the insignificant rare, and the whole a perfect harmony. After she had seen everything and measured her soul against it, she went again into the garden, to the shallow basin that, over eons, nature had formed in the rock. Once more she purified her hands and mouth with the cool, fresh water, drying them on a new towel. When she had settled back into her place he said, Perhaps now you would take cha? It would be my honor. But please do not put yourself to so much trouble on my account. It is my honor. You are my guest. 
so he had served her. And now there was the ending. In the silence, Mariko did not move for a moment, but stayed in her tranquility, not wishing yet to acknowledge the ending or disturb the peace surrounding her. But she felt the growing strength of his eyes. The Chanoyu was ended. Now life must begin again. You did it perfectly, she whispered, her sadness overwhelming her. A tear slid from her eyes and the falling ripped the heart from his chest. No, no. Please excuse me. You are perfect. It was ordinary, he said, startled by such unexpected praise. It was the best I've ever seen, she said, moved by the stark honesty in his voice. No. No, please excuse me. If it was fair it was because of you, Mariko-san. It was only fair you made it better. For me it was flawless. Everything. How sad that others, more worthy than I, couldn't have witnessed it also. Her eyes glistened in the flickering light. You witnessed it. That is everything. It was only for you. Others wouldn't have understood. She felt the hot tears now on her cheeks. Normally she would have been ashamed of them, but now they did not trouble her. Thank you, how can I thank you? He picked up a sprig of wild thyme and, his fingers trembling, leaned over and gently caught one of her tears. Silently he looked down at the tear, and the branch let dwarfed by his huge fist. My work any work is inadequate against the beauty of this. Thank you. He watched the tear on the leaf. A piece of charcoal fell down the mountain and without thinking, he picked up the tongs and replaced it. A few sparks danced into the air from the mountaintop, and it became an erupting volcano. Both drifted into a sweet melancholia, joined by the simplicity of the single tear, content together in the quiet, joined in humility, knowing that what had been given had been returned in purity. Later he said, If our duty did not forbid it, I would ask you to join me in death. Now, I would go with you. Gladly, she answered at once. Let us go to death. Now, we can't. Our duty is to Lord Toranaga. She took out the stiletto that was in her obi and reverently placed it on the tatame. Then please allow me to prepare the way. No, that would be failing in our duty. What is to be, will be. You and I cannot turn the scale. Yes. But we may not go before our master. Neither you nor I. He needs every trustworthy vassal for a little longer. Please excuse me. I must forbid it. I would be pleased to go tonight. I'm prepared. More than that, I totally desire to go beyond. Yes. My soul is brimming with joy. A hesitant smile. Please excuse me for being selfish. You're perfectly right about our duty. The razor-sharp blade glistened in the candlelight. They watched it, lost in contemplation. Then he broke the spell. Why Osaka, Mariko-san? There are things to be done there which only I can do. His frown deepened as he watched the light from a guttering wick catch the tear and become refracted into a billion colors. What things? Things that concern the future of our house which must be done by me. In that case you must go. He looked at her searchingly. But you alone? Yes. I wish to make sure all family arrangements are perfect between us and Lord Kiyama for Saruji's marriage. Money and dowry and lands and so on. There's his increased fief to formalize. Lord Hiromatsu and Lord Toranaga require it done. I am responsible for the house. Yes, he said slowly. That's your duty. His eyes held hers. If Lord Toranaga says you can go, then go, but it's not likely you'll be permitted there. Even so. You must return quickly. Very quickly. It would be unwise to stay in Osaka a moment longer than necessary. Yes. By sea would be quicker than by road. But you've always hated the sea. I still hate the sea. Do you have to be there quickly? I don't think half a month or a month would matter. Perhaps, I don't know. I just feel I should go at once. Then we will leave the time and the matter of the going to Lord Toranaga if he permits you to go at all. With Lord Zataki here, 
and the two scrolls, that can only mean war. It will be too dangerous to go. Yes. Thank you. Glad that that was now finished, he looked around the little room contentedly, unconcerned now that his ugly bulk dominated the space, each of his thighs broader than her waist, his arms thicker than her neck. This has been a fine room, better than I dared to hope. I've enjoyed being here. I'm reminded again that a body's nothing but a hut in the wilderness. Thank you for being here. I'm so glad you came to Yokos, Mariko-san. If it hadn't been for you I would never have given a Chano you here and never felt so one with eternity. She hesitated, then shyly picked up the Tang Chakati. It was a simple, covered jar without adornment. The orange-brown glaze had run just short, leaving an uneven rim of bare porcelain at the bottom, dramatizing the spontaneity of the potter and his unwillingness to disguise the simplicity of his materials. Bantaro had bought it from Sinicata, the most famous cha master who had ever lived, for twenty thousand koku. It's so beautiful, she murmured, enjoying the touch of it. So perfect for the ceremony. Yes. You were truly a master tonight, Bantaro-san. You gave me so much happiness. Her voice was low and intent, and she leaned forward a little. Everything was perfect for me, the garden and how you used artistry to overcome the flaws with light and shadow. And this, again she touched the cha caddy. Everything perfect, even the character you'd written on the towel, AI affection. For me tonight, affection was the perfect word. Again tears spilled down her cheeks. Please excuse me, she said, brushing them away. He bowed, embarrassed by such praise. To hide it he began to wrap the caddy in its silken sheets. When he had finished, he set it into its box and placed it carefully in front of her. Mariko-san, if our house has money problems, take this. Sell it. Never. It was the only possession, apart from his swords and longbow that he prized in life. That would be the last thing I would ever sell. Please excuse me, but if pay for my vassals is a problem, take it. There's enough for all of them, with care. And the best weapons and the best horses. In that, our house is strong. No, Bantaro-san, the tang is yours. We've not much time left to us. Who should I will it to? Suriji? She looked at the coals and the fire consuming the volcano, humbling it. No. Not until he's a worthy cha master, equaling his father. I counsel you to leave the tang to Lord Toranaga, who's worthy of it, and ask him before he dies to judge if our son will ever merit receiving it. And if Lord Toranaga loses and dies before winter, as I'm certain he'll lose. What? Here in this privacy I can tell you quietly that truth without pretense. Isn't an important part of the Chano you to be without pretense? Yes, he will lose, unless he gets Kiyama and Onoshure and Zataki. In that case, set down in your will that the Tang should be sent with a cortege to his imperial highness, petition him to accept it. Certainly the Tang merits divinity. Yes. That would be the perfect choice. He studied the knife then added gloomily. Ah, Mariko-san, there's nothing to be done for Lord Toranaga. His karma's written. He wins or he loses. And if he wins or loses, there'll be a great killing. Yes. Brooding, he took his eyes off her knife and contemplated the wild thyme sprig, the tears still pure. Later he said, If he loses, before I die or if I'm dead I or one of my men will kill the Anjin-san. Her face was ethereal against the darkness. The soft breeze moved threads of her hair, making her seem even more statue-like. Please excuse me, may I ask why? He's too dangerous to leave alive. His knowledge, his ideas that I've heard even fifth hand. Dot he'll infect the realm, even Lord Yaman. Lord Toranaga's already under his spell, nay? Lord Toranaga enjoys his knowledge, Mariko said. The moment Lord Toranaga dies... That also is the Anjin San's death order. But I hope our Lord's eyes are opened before that time. The guttering lamp spluttered and went out. 
He glanced up at her. Are you under his spell? He's a fascinating man. But his mind's so different from ours. His values. Yes, so different in so many ways that it's almost impossible to understand him at times. Once I tried to explain a Chanoyu to him, but it was beyond him. It must be terrible to be born barbarian terrible. Bataro said. Yes. His eyes dropped to the blade of her stiletto. Some people think the Anjin-san was Japanese in a previous life. He's not like other barbarians and he. He tries hard to speak and act like one of us though he fails, nay? I wish you'd seen him almost commit seppuku Bantaro-san. Aye, it was extraordinary. I saw death visit him, to be turned away by Omi's hand. If he was Japanese previously, I think that would explain many things. Lord Toranaga thinks he's very valuable to us now. It's time you stopped training him and became Japanese again. Sire? I think Lord Toranaga's under his spell. And you? Please excuse me, but I don't think I am. That other night in Anjiro, the one that went bad, on that night I felt you were with him, against me. Of course it was an evil thought, but I felt it. Her gaze left the blade. She looked at him steadily and did not reply. Another lamp spluttered briefly and went out. Now only one light remained in the room. Yes, I hated him that night, Bantaro continued in the same calm voice, and wanted him dead in you and Fujiko-san. My bow whispered to me, like it does sometimes, asking for a killing. And when, the next dawn, I saw him coming down the hill with those cowardly little pistols in his hands, my arrows begged to drink his blood. But I put his killing off and humbled myself, hating my bad manners more than him, shamed by my bad manners and the sake. His tiredness showed now. So many shames to bear you and I, nay? Yes. You don't want me to kill him? You must do what you know to be your duty, she said. As I will always do mine. We stay at the inn tonight, he said. Yes. And then, because she had been a perfect guest and the Chanoyu the best he had ever achieved, he changed his mind and gave her back time and peace in equal measure that he had received from her. Go to the inn. Sleep, he said. His hand picked up the stiletto and offered it. When the maples are bare of leaves or when you return from Osaka we will begin again. As husband and wife. Yes. Thank you. Do you agree freely, Mariko-san? Yes. Thank you. Before your God? Yes. Before God. Mariko bowed and accepted the knife, replaced it in its hiding place, bowed again and left. Her footsteps died away. Bantaro looked down at the branchlet still in his fist, the tear still trapped in a tiny leaf. His fingers trembled as they gently laid the sprig on the last of the coals. The pure green leaves began to twist and char. The tear vanished with a hiss. Then, in silence, he began to weep with rage, suddenly sure in his innermost being that she had betrayed him with the Anjin-san. Blackthorn saw her come out of the garden and walk across the well-lit courtyard. He caught his breath at the whiteness of her beauty. Dawn was creeping into the eastern sky. Hello, Mariko-san. Oh, hello, Anjin-san. You so sorry, you startled me I didn't see you there. You're up late. No. Goman Nasa, I'm on time. He smiled and motioned to the morning that was not far off. It's a habit I picked up at sea, to wake just before dawn in good time to go aloft to get ready to shoot the sun. His smile deepened. It's you who are up late. I didn't realize that it was. That night was gone. Samurai were posted at the gates and all doorways, watching curiously, Naga among them. Her voice became almost imperceptible as she switched to Latin. Guard thine eyes, I beg thee. Even the darkness of night contains harbingers of doom. I beg forgiveness. They glanced away as horses clattered up to the main gate. Falconers and the hunting party and guards. Dispiritedly Toranaga came from within. Everything's ready, sire, Naga said. May I come with you? 
No, no, thank you. You get some rest. Mariko-san, how was the Chano you? Most beautiful, sire. Most very beautiful. Buntaro-san's a master. You're fortunate. Yes, sire. Anjin-san. Would you like to go hunting? I'd like to learn how you fly a falcon. Sire? Mariko translated at once. Yes, thank you, Blackthorn said. Good. Torunaga waved him to a horse. You come with me. Yes, sire. Mariko watched them leave. When they had trotted up the path, she went to her room. Her maid helped her undress, remove her makeup, and take down her hair. Then she told the maid to stay in the room, that she was not to be disturbed until noon. Yes, mistress. Mariko lay down and closed her eyes and allowed her body to fall into the exquisite softness of the down quilts. She was exhausted and elated. The Chanoyu had pushed her to a strange height of peacefulness, cleansing her, and from there, the sublime, joy-filled decision to go into death had sent her to a further pinnacle never attained before. Returning from the summit into life once more had left her with an eerie, unbelievable awareness of the beauty of being alive. She had seemed to be outside herself as she answered Buntaro patiently, sure her answers and her performance had been equally perfect. She curled up in the bed, so glad that peace existed now until the leaves fell. Oh, Madonna, she prayed fervently, I thank thee for thy mercy in granting me my glorious reprieve. I thank thee and worship thee with all my heart and with all my soul and for all eternity. She repeated an Ave Maria in humility and then, asking forgiveness, in accordance to her custom and in obedience to her liege lord, for another day she put her God into a compartment of her mind. What would I have done, she mused just before sleep took her, if Buntaro had asked to share my bed? I would have refused. And then, if he had insisted, as is his right? I would have kept my promise to him. Oh, yes. Nothing's changed. Chapter 44 At the hour of the goat the cortege crossed the bridge again. Everything was as before, except that now Zataki and his men were lightly dressed for traveling or skirmishing. They were all heavily armed and, though very well disciplined, all were spoiling for the death fight, if it came. They seated themselves neatly opposite Torinaga's forces, which heavily outnumbered them. Father Alvito was to one side among the onlookers. And Blackthorn. Torinaga welcomed Zataki with the same calm formality, prolonging the ceremonious seating. Today the two daimyos were alone on the dais, the cushions farther apart under a lower sky. Yabu, Omi, Naga, and Buntaro were on the earth surrounding Toranaga and four of Zataki's fighting counselors spaced themselves behind him. At the correct time, Zataki took out the second scroll. I've come for your formal answer. I agree to go to Osaka and to submit to the will of the council, replied Toranaga evenly and bowed. You're going to submit? Zataki began, his face twisting with disbelief. You, Toranaga no Minawara, you're going... Listen, Torinaga interrupted in his resonant commanding voice that ricocheted around the clearing without seeming to be loud. The Council of Regents should be obeyed. Even though it's illegal, it is constituted and no single daimyo has the right to tear the realm apart, however much truth is on his side. The realm takes precedence. If one daimyo revolts, it is the duty of all to stamp him out. I swore to the Tycho I'd never be the first to break the peace, and I won't, even though evil is in the land. I accept the invitation. I will leave today. Aghast, each samurai was trying to foretell what this unbelievable about face would mean. All were achingly certain that most, if not all, would be forced to become ronin, with all that that implied loss of honor, of revenue, of family, of future. Buntaro knew that he would accompany Torinaga on his last journey and share his fate death with all his family, of all generations. Ishido was too much his own personal enemy to forgive, and anyway, who would want to stay alive when his own lord gave up the true fight in such cowardly fashion? Karma, Buntaro thought bitterly. 
but it give me strength. Now I'm committed to take Mariko's life and our son's life before I take my own. When? When my duty's done and our Lord is safely and honorably gone into the void. He will need a faithful second, nay? All gone, like autumn leaves, all the future and the present, crimson sky and destiny. It's just as well, nay? Now Lord Yemen will surely inherit. Lord Torunaga must be secretly tempted in his most private heart to take power, however much he denies it. Perhaps the Tycho will live again through his son and in time, we'll war on China again and win this time, to stand at the summit of the world as is our divine duty. Yes, the Lady Okiba and Yemen won't sell us out next time as Ishido and his cowardly supporters did the last. Naga was bewildered. No crimson sky? No honorable war? No fighting to the death in the Shinano Mountains or on the Kyoto Plains? No honorable death in battle heroically defending the standard of his father, no mounds of enemy dead to straddle in a last glorious stand, or in a divine victory? No charge even with the filthy guns? None of that just a seppuku, probably. Hurried, without pomp or ceremony or honor, and his head stuck on a spike for common people to jeer at. Just a death and the end of the Yoshi line. For of course every one of them would die, his father, all his brothers and sisters and cousins, nephews and nieces and aunts and uncles. His eyes focused on Zataki. Blood lust began to flood his brain. Omi was watching Toranaga with half-seeing eyes, hatred devouring him. Our master's gone mad, he thought. How can he be so stupid? We've a hundred thousand men and the musket regiment, and fifty thousand more around Osaka. Crimson skies a million times better than a lonely stinking grave. His hand was heavy on his sword hilt, and for an ecstatic moment, he imagined himself leaping forward to decapitate Toranaga, to hand the head to the regent Zataki and so end the contemptuous charade. Then to die by his own hand with honor, here, before everyone. For what was the point of living now? Now Kiku was beyond his reach, her contract bought and owned by Torunaga who had betrayed them all. Last night his body had been on fire during her singing, and he knew her song had been secretly for him, and him alone. Unrequited fire him and her. Wait why not a suicide together? To die beautifully together to be together for all eternity. Oh, how wonderful that would be! To mix our souls in death as a never-ending witness to our adoration of life. But first the traitor Toranaga, nay? With an effort Omi dragged himself back from the brink. Everything's gone wrong, he thought. No peace in my house, always anger and quarreling, and Midori always in tears. No nearer my revenge on Yabu. No private, secret arrangement with Sataki, with or without Yabu, negotiated over the hours last night. No deal of any kind. Nothing right anymore. Even when Mura found the swords, both were so mutilated by the earth's force that I know Toranaga hated me for showing them to him. And now finally this this cowardly, traitorous surrender. It's almost as though I'm bedeviled in an evil spell. Cast by the Anjinsan? Perhaps but everything's still lost. No swords and no revenge and no secret escape route and no kiku and no future. Wait. There's a future with her. Death's a future and past and present and it'll be so clean and simple. You're giving up? We're not going to war? Yabu bellowed, aware that his death and the death of his line were now guaranteed. I accept the council's invitation, Torinaga replied. As you will accept the council's invitation. I won't do. Omi came out of his reverie with enough presence of mind to know that he had to interrupt Yabu and protect him from the instant death that any confrontation with Toranaga would bring. But he deliberately froze his lips, shouting to himself with glee at this heaven sent gift, and waited for Yabu's disaster to overtake him. You won't do what? Toranaga asked. Yabu's soul shrieked danger. He managed to croak. I, of course, your vassals will obey. Yes, if you decide whatever you decide, I will do. 
Omi cursed and allowed the glazed expression to return, his mind still withered by Torinaga's totally unexpected capitulation. Angrily Torinaga let Yabu stutter on, increasing the strength of the apology. Then contemptuously he cut him short. Good. He turned back to Zataki but he did not relax his vigil. So, brother, you can put away the second scroll. There's nothing more. From the corner of his eye he saw Naga's face change and he wheeled on him. Naga! The youth almost leapt out of his skin, but his hand left his sword. Yes, father? He stammered. Go and fetch my writing materials. Now! When Naga was well out of sword range Torinaga exhaled, relieved that he had prevented the attack on Zataki before it had begun. His eyes studied Bantaro carefully. Then Omi. And last Yabu. He thought the three of them were now sufficiently controlled not to make any foolish move that would precipitate an immediate riot and a great killing. Once again he addressed Zataki. I'll give you my formal written acceptance at once. This will prepare the council for my state visit. He lowered his voice and spoke for Zataki's ears alone. Inside Isa you're safe, regent. Outside it you're safe. Until my mother's out of your grasp you're safe. Only until then. This meeting is over. Good. State visit? Zataki was openly contemptuous. What hypocrisy! I never thought I'd see the day when Yoshi Toranaga no Minawara would count out to General Ishido. You're just, which is more important, brother? Toranaga said. The continuity of my line or the continuity of the realm? Gloom hung over the valley. It was pouring now, the base of the clouds barely three hundred feet from the ground, obscuring completely the way back up the pass. The clearing and the inn's forecourt were filled with shoving, ill-tempered samurai. Horses stamped their feet irritably. Officers were shouting orders with unnecessary harshness. Frightened porters were rushing about readying the departing column. Barely an hour remained to darkness. Torinaga had written the flowery message and signed it, sending it by messenger to Zataki, over the entreaties of Bantaro, Omi, and Yabu, in private conference. He had listened to their arguments silently. When they had finished, he said, I want no more talk. I've decided my path. Obey. He had told them he was returning to Anjiro immediately to collect the rest of his men. Tomorrow he would head up the east coast road toward Adami and Odawara, thence over the mountain passes to Yido. Bantaro would command his escort. Tomorrow the musket regiment was to embark on the galleys at Anjiro and put to sea to await him at Yido, Jabu in command. The following day Omi was ordered to the frontier via the central road with all available Aizu warriors. He was to assist Hiromatsu, who was in overall command, and was to make sure that the enemy, Ekawa Jikyu, did nothing to interfere with normal traffic. Omi was to base himself in Mishima for the time being, to guard that section of the Takedo Road, and to prepare palanquins and horses in sufficient quantity for Toranaga and the considerable entourage that was necessary to a formal state visit. Alert all stations along the road and prepare them equally. You understand? Yes, sire. Make sure that everything's perfect. Yes, sire. You may rely on me. Even Omi had winced under the baleful glare. When everything was ready for his departure, Torinaga came out from his rooms onto the veranda. Everyone bowed. Sourly he motioned them to continue and sent for the innkeeper. The man fawned as he presented the bill on his knees. Torinaga checked it item by item. The bill was very fair. He nodded and threw it at his paymaster for payment, then summoned Mariko and the Anjinsan. Mariko was given permission to go to Osaka. But first you'll go directly. From here to Mishima. Give this private dispatch to Hiromatsu-san, then continue on to Yido with the Anjin-san. You're responsible for him until you arrive. You'll probably go by sea to Osaka, I'll decide that later. Anjin-san. Did you get the dictionary from the priest-san? Please? So sorry, I don't understand. Mariko had translated. Sorry. 
Yes, I book got. When we meet in Yido, you'll speak better Japanese than you do now. Wakarimasu ka? Hi. Gomen Nasai. Despondently Torinaga stomped out of the courtyard, a samurai holding a large umbrella for him against the rain. As one, all samurai porters and villagers again bowed. Torinaga paid no attention to them, just got into his roofed palanquin at the head of the column and closed the curtains. At once, the six semi-naked bearers raised the litter and started off at a loping trot, their horny bare feet splashing the puddles. Mounted escorting samurai rode ahead, and another mounted guard surrounded the palanquin. Spare porters and the baggage train followed, all hurrying, all tense and filled with dread. Omi led the van. Bantaro was to command the rear guard. Yabu and Naga had already left for the musket regiment that was still athwart the road in ambush to await Torinaga at the crest. It would fall in behind to form a rear guard. Regard against whom? Yabu had snarled at Omi in the few moments of privacy they had had before he galloped off. Buntaro strode back to the high, curved gateway of the inn, careless of the downpour. Mariko San! Obediently she hurried to him, her orange oiled paper umbrella beaten by the heavy drops. Yes, sire? His eyes raced over her under the brim of his bamboo hat, then went to Blackthorn, who watched from the veranda. Tell him. He stopped. Sire? He stared down at her. Tell him I hold him responsible for you. Yes, sire, she said. But please excuse me, I am responsible for me. Bantaro turned and measured the distance to the head of the column. When he glanced back his face showed a trace of his torment. Now there'll be no falling leaves for our eyes, nay. That is in the hands of God, sire. No, that's in Lord Torinaga's hands, he said with disdain. She looked up at him without wavering under his stare. The rain beat down. Droplets fell from the rim of her umbrella like a curtain of tears. Mud splattered the hem of her kimono. Then he said, Sayonara until I see you at Osaka. She was startled. Oh, so sorry, won't I see you at Yido? Surely you'll be there with Lord Torinaga. You'll arrive about the same time, nay? I'll see you then. Yes. But at Osaka, when we meet there or when you return from there, then we begin again. That's when I'll truly see you, nay? Ah, uh, I understand. So sorry. Sayonara, Mariko-san. He said. Sayonara, my lord. Mariko bowed. He returned her obeisance peremptorily and strode through the quagmire to his horse. He swung into the saddle and galloped away without looking back. Go with God, she said, staring after him. Blackthorn saw her eyes following Buntaro. He waited in the lee of the roof, the rain lessening. Soon the head of the column vanished into the clouds, then Torinaga's palanquin, and he breathed easier still shattered by Torinaga and the whole Illumin day. This morning the hawking had begun so well. He had chosen a tiny, long-winged falcon, like a merlin, and flew her very successfully at a lark, the stoop and soaring chase blown southward beyond a belt of trees by the freshening wind. Leading the charge as was his privilege, he careered through the forest along a well-beaten path, itinerant peddlers and farmers scattering. But a weather-beaten oil seller with an equally threadbare horse blocked the way and cantankerously wouldn't budge. In the excitement of the chase Blackthorn had shouted at the man to move, but the peddler would not, so he cursed him roundly. The oil seller replied rudely and shouted back and then Torinaga was there and Torinaga pointed at his own bodyguard and said, Anjin-san, give him your sword a moment, and some other words he did not understand. Blackthorn obeyed at once. Before he realized what was happening, the samurai lunged at the peddler. His blow was so savage and so perfect that the oil seller had walked on a pace before falling, divided in two at the waist. Torunaga had pounded his pommel with momentary delight, then fell back into his melancholy as the other samurai had cheered. The bodyguard cleansed the blade carefully, using his silken sash to protect the steel. 
He sheathed the sword with satisfaction and returned it, saying something that Mariko explained later. He just said, Anjin-san, that he was proud to be allowed to test such a blade. Lord Toronaga is suggesting you should nickname the sword oil seller, because such a blow and such sharpness should be remembered with honor. Your sword has now become legend, nay? Blackthorn recalled how he had nodded, hiding his anguish. He was wearing oil seller. Now oil seller it would be forevermore the same sword that Toronaga had presented to him. I wish he'd never given it to me, he thought. But it wasn't all their fault. It was mine, too. I shouted at the man. He was rude in return, and samurai may not be treated rudely. What other course was there? Blackthorn knew there was none. Even so, the killing had taken the joy out of the hunt for him, though he had to hide that carefully because Torunaga had been moody and difficult all day. Just before noon, they had returned to Yokos, then there was Torunaga's meeting with Sataki, and then after a steaming bath and massage, suddenly Father Alvito was standing in his way like a vengeful wraith, two hostile acolytes in attendance. Christ Jesus, get away from me! There's no need to be afraid, or to blaspheme, Alvito had said. God curse you and all priests, Blackthorn said, trying to get hold of himself, knowing that he was deep in enemy territory. Earlier he'd seen half a hundred Catholic samurai trickling over the bridge to the mass that Mariko had told him was being held in the forecourt of Alvito's inn. His hand sought the hilt of his sword, but he was not wearing it with his bathrobe or carrying it as was customary, and he cursed his stupidity, hating to be unarmed. May God forgive you your blasphemy, Pilate. Yes. May he forgive you and open your eyes. I bear you no malice. I came to bring you a gift. Here, here's a gift from God, Pilate. Blackthorn took the package suspiciously. When he opened it and saw the Portuguese Latin Japanese dictionary slash grammar, a thrill rushed through him. He leafed through a few pages. The printing was certainly the best he had ever seen, the quality and detail of the information staggering. Yes, this is a gift from God all right, but Lord Toronaga ordered you to give it to me. We obey only God's orders. Toronaga asked you to give it to me? Yes. It was his request. And a Toronaga request isn't an order? That depends, Captain Pilot, on who you are, what you are, and how great your faith. Alvito motioned at the book. Three of our brethren spent twenty-seven years preparing that. Why are you giving it to me? We were asked to. Why didn't you avoid Lord Toronaga's request? You're more than cunning enough to do that. Alvito shrugged. Quickly Blackthorn flicked through all the pages, checking. Excellent paper the printing very clear. The numbers of the pages were in sequence. It's complete, Alvito said, amused. We don't deal with half books. This is much too valuable to give away. What do you want in return? He asked us to give it to you. The father visitor agreed. So you are given it. It was only printed this year, at long last. It's beautiful, isn't it? We only ask you to cherish it to treat the book well. It's worth treating well. It's worth guarding with a life. This is priceless knowledge, like one of your rudders. But this is better. What do you want for it? We ask nothing in return. I don't believe you. Blackthorn waited in his hand, even more suspiciously. You must know this makes me equal to you. It gives me all your knowledge and saves us ten, maybe twenty years. With this I'll soon be speaking as well as you. Once I can do that, I can teach others. This is the key to Japan, nay? Language is the key to anywhere foreign, nay? In six months I'll be able to talk direct to Torunaga-sama. Yes, perhaps you will. If you have six months. What does that mean? Nothing more than what you already know. Lord Torunaga will be dead long before six months is up. Why? What news did you bring him? Ever since he talked with you he's been like a bull with half its throat ripped out. What did you say, eh? My message was private, 
from his eminence to Lord Toronaga. I'm sorry I'm merely a messenger. But General Ishido controls Osaka, as you surely know, and when Toronaga-sama goes to Osaka everything is finished for him. And for you. Blackthorn felt ice in his marrow. Why me? You can't escape your fate, pilot. You helped Toronaga against Ishido. Have you forgotten? You put your hands violently on Ishido. You led the dash out of Osaka Harbor. I'm sorry, but being able to speak Japanese, or your swords and samurai status won't help you at all. Perhaps it's worse now that you're samurai. Now you'll be ordered to commit seppuku and if you refuse. Alvito had added in the same gentle voice. I told you before, they are a simple people. We English are simple people, too, he said, with no little bravado. When we're dead, we're dead, but before that we put our trust in God and keep our powder dry. I've a few tricks left, never fear. Oh, I don't fear, pilot. I fear nothing, not you nor your heresy, nor your guns. They're all spiked as you're spiked. That's karma in the hands of God, call it what you will, Blackthorn told him, rattled. But by the Lord God, I'll get my ship back and then, in a couple of years, I'll lead a squadron of English ships out here and blow you all to hell out of Asia. Alvito spoke again with his vast unnerving calm. That's in the hands of God, pilot. But here the die is cast, and nothing of what you say will happen. Nothing. Alvito had looked at him as though he were already dead. May God have mercy on you, for as God is my judge, pilot, I believe you'll never leave these islands. Blackthorn shivered, remembering the total conviction with which Alvito had said that. You're cold, Anjinsan? Mariko was standing beside him on the veranda now, shaking out her umbrella in the dusk. Oh, sorry, no, I'm not cold, I was just wandering. He glanced up at the pass. The whole column had vanished into the cloud bank. The rain had abetted a little and had become mild and soft. Some villagers and servants splashed through the puddles, homeward bound. The forecourt was empty, the garden waterlogged. Oil lanterns were coming on throughout the village. No longer were there sentries on the gateway, or at both sides of the bridge. A great emptiness seemed to dominate the twilight. It's much prettier at night, isn't it? She said. Yes, he replied, totally aware that they were alone together, and safe, if they were careful and if she wanted as he wanted. A maid came and took her umbrella, bringing dry tabby socks. She knelt and began to towel Mariko's feet dry. Tomorrow at dawn we'll begin our journey, Anjin-san. How long will it take us? A number of days, Anjin-san, Lord Toranaga said. Mariko glanced off as Gyoko padded obsequiously from inside the inn. Lord Toranaga told me there was plenty of time. Gyoko bowed low. Good evening, Lady Toda. Please excuse me for interrupting you. How are you, Gyoko-san? Fine, thank you, though I wish this rain would stop. I don't like this mugginess. But then, when the rains stop... We have the heat and that's so much worse, nay? But the autumn's not far away. Ah, uh, we're so lucky to have autumn to look forward to, and heavenly spring, nay? Mariko did not answer. The maid fastened the tabby for her and got up. Thank you, Mariko said, dismissing her. So, Gyoko-san? There's something I can do for you? Kiku-san asked if you would like her to serve you at dinner or to dance or sing for you tonight. Lord Toranaga left instructions for her to entertain you, if you wished. Yes, he told me, Gyoko-san. That would be very nice, but perhaps not tonight. We have to leave at dawn and I'm very tired. There'll be other nights, nay? Please give her my apologies, and oh yes, please tell her I'm delighted to have the company of you both on the road. Toranaga had ordered Mariko to take the two women with her, and she had thanked him pleased to have them as a formal chaperone. You're too kind, Gyoko said with honey on her tongue. But it's our honor. We're still to go to Yido? Yes. Of course. Why? Nothing, Lady Toda. 
But in that case, perhaps we could stop in Mishima for a day or two? Kiku-san would like to gather up some clothes she doesn't feel adequately gowned for Lord Toranaga, and I hear the Yido summer's very sultry and mosquitoed. We should collect her wardrobe, bad as it is. Yes. Of course. You'll both have more than enough time. Gyoko did not look at Blackthorn, though both were very conscious of him. It's it's tragic about our master, nay? Karma, Mariko replied evenly. Then she added with a woman's sweet viciousness. But nothing's changed, Gyoko-san. You'll be paid the day you arrive, in silver, as the contract says. Oh, so sorry, the older woman told her, pretending to be shocked. So sorry, Lady Toda, but money? That was farthest from my mind. Never. I was only concerned with our master's future. He's master of his own future, Mariko said easily believing it no more. But your future's good, isn't it whatever happens? You're rich now. All your worldly troubles are over. Soon you'll be a power in Yido with your new guild of courtesans, whoever rules the Quanto. Soon you'll be the greatest of all Mama-sans, and whatever happens, well, Kiku-san's still your protege and her use not touched, either is her karma. Nay, my only concern is for Lord Toranaga. Gyoko answered with practiced gravity, her anus twitching at the thought of 2,500 kokus so nearly in her strong room. If there is any way I could help him I would, how generous of you, Gyoko-san. I'll tell him of your offer. Yes, a thousand koku off the price would help very much. I accept on his behalf. Gyoko fluttered her fan, put a gracious smile on her face and just managed not to wail aloud at her imbecility for jumping into a trap like a sake-besotted novice. Oh no, Lady Toda, how could money help so generous a patron? No, clearly money's no help to him, she babbled, trying to recover. No, money's no help. Better information or a service or, please excuse me, what information? None, none at the moment. I was just using that as a figure of speech. So sorry. But money, ah, uh, so sorry, yes. Well, I'll tell him of your offer. And of your generosity. On his behalf, thank you. Gyoko bowed at the dismissal and scuttled back into the inn. Mariko's little laugh trickled out. What are you laughing at, Mariko-san? She told him what had been said. Mama-san's must be the same the world over. She's just worried about her money. Will Lord Toranaga pay even though? Blackthorn stopped. Mariko waited guilelessly. Then, under her gaze, he continued, Father Alvito said when Lord Toranaga goes to Osaka, he's finished. Oh, yes. Yes, Anjin-san, that's most very true, Mariko said with a brightness she did not feel. Then she put Toranaga and Osaka into their compartments and was tranquil again. But Osaka's many leagues away and countless sticks of time in the future, and until that time when what is to be is, Ishido doesn't know, the good father doesn't truly know, we don't know, no one knows what will truly happen. Nay, except the Lord God. But he won't tell us, will he? Until perhaps it has already come to pass. Nay, hi. He laughed with her. Ah, you're so wise. Thank you. I have a suggestion, Anjin-san. During the journey time, let us forget all outside problems. All of them. Thou, he said in Latin, it is good to see thee. And thee. Extraordinary care in front of both women during our journey is very necessary, nay? Depend on it, lady. I do. In truth, I do very much. Now we are almost alone, nay? Thou and I, yes. But what was is not and never happened. True. Yes. Thou art correct again. And beautiful. A samurai strode through the gateway and saluted her. He was middle-aged with graying hair, his face pitted, and he walked with a slight limp. Please excuse me, Lady Toda, but we'll leave at dawn, nay? Yes, Yashinaka-san. But it doesn't matter if we're delayed till noon, if you wish. We've plenty of time. 
Yes. As you prefer, let us leave at noon. Good evening, Anjin-san. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Akira Yashinaka, captain of your escort. Good evening, captain. Yashinaka turned back to Mariko. I'm responsible for you and him, lady, so please tell him I've ordered two men to sleep in his room by night as his personal guards. Then there'll be ten sentries on duty nightly. They'll be all around you. I've a hundred men in all. Very well, Captain. But so sorry, it would be better not to station any men in the engines' room. It's a very serious custom of theirs to sleep alone, or alone with one lady. My maid will probably be with him, so he'll be protected. Please keep the guards around but not too close, then he won't be unsettled. Yashinaka scratched his head and frowned. Very well, lady. Yes, I'll agree to that, though my way's more sensible. Then, so sorry, then please ask him not to go on any of these night walks of his. Until we get to Yido I'm responsible, and when I'm responsible for very important persons I get very nervous. He bowed stiffly and went away. The captain asks you not to walk off by yourself during our journey. If you get up at night, always take a samurai with you, Anjin-san. He says this would help him. All right. Yes, I'll do that. Blackthorn was watching him leave. What else did he say? I caught something about sleeping? I couldn't understand him very. He stopped. Kiku came from within. She wore a bathrobe with a towel decorously swathed around her hair. Barefoot, she sauntered toward the hot spring bathhouse, half bowed to them, and waved gaily. They returned her salutation. Blackthorn took in her long legs and the sinuousness of her walk until she disappeared. He felt Mariko's eyes watching him closely and looked back at her. No, he said blandly and shook his head. She laughed. I thought it might be difficult might be uncomfortable for you to have her just as a traveling companion after such a special pillowing. Uncomfortable, no. On the contrary, very pleasant. I've very pleasant memories. I'm glad she belongs to Lord Toronaga now. That makes everything easy, for her, and for him. And everyone. He was going to add, everyone except Omi, but thought better of it. After all, to me she was only a very special, glorious gift. Nothing more. Nay. She was a gift, yes. He wanted to touch Mariko. But he did not. Instead he turned and stared up at the pass, not sure what he read behind her eyes. Night obscured the pass now. And the clouds? Water dripped nicely from the roof. What else did the captain say? Nothing of importance, Anjin-san. 